Hey guys, and welcome to another tour with Chris Sandeman. Hey, Sandeman's live. Here we go. We're going to start exploring the Upper West Side uh, up into Morningside Heights. But I will talk to you the entire time, so don't hesitate to do that. If you are new to this channel, please go ahead and like this video. Helps a ton, as well as subscribe. Subscribing. You know, that way you always know about more notifications that are coming up. And if I was anyone else, I'd hit you up for money, but no, I just want you guys to, to save that cash for another tour guide who you do a live stream with and help them out because, because that helps. So where am I right now? Let me show you. Oh, 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 very exciting. Let me see if I can find it. Where did I put it? Oh, it's in my, it's in my bag of goodies. Let's see. Uh, <gasps> you guys see this? This is a little stylus pusher. So now, instead of my big fat finger getting in the way of the screen every time, oh, well, turns out it doesn't work as well in the rain, but it still works. Uh, there we go. Daniel Musha, hi from Rosendale, New York, raining here too. Fantastic. Well, it's, you know what guys? It's what they say, right? April shower or May showers, spring, June flowers, something like that. Closing up my bag. And uh, what are we looking at here? We're looking at an equestrian statue. And who is this equestrian statue of? It's none other than Joan of Arc. And the reason why I wanted to start up here uh, at uh, Joan of Arc Park, so to say, is because it's a beautiful little space. And it also shows us um, the very first statue of a real woman in New York City, right? The very first time an actual non-fictitious woman is given a statue. Um, and on top of that, as a double whammy, this statue was, was sculpted by Anna Hyatt Huntington, a woman. So it's the first female, question, first female statue in New York, as well as being sculpted by a woman. It's bronze. Um, and it was uh, funded and put up here in 1915. Um, they had to raise a bundle of money to be able to, uh, to put together, which is $35,000 back in the day. In today's money, that's about $885,000. It's kind of incredible to think that a million dollars, almost a million dollars, over three quarters of a million dollars, went into this, this statue. But it's beautiful. It's amazing. And even though it's bronze, you can really get a sense of, of the motion, of the movement, you know? Like, Joan is thrusting upwards uh, with her sword and on this horse. And uh, I think it's really miraculous. It's one of the new things that I discovered while I was, you know, exploring to put together this tour. Uh, and, uh, and hence, I wanted to, to show it to you guys. Now, the money uh, was donated by a guy by the name, of, mostly by a guy by the name of Jay Sanford Saltas. Uh, and, uh, and that helped fund uh, Huntington's work, which was really kind of blew up after this, the, the female sculptor, Anna Hyatt Huntington, um, especially because none other than Thomas Edison's second wife, Mina Edison, was in attendance at the unveiling. Now, if we just look down really quick, bye Joan, we'll see you in a little bit, we can look at this pedestal below her, which is also equally gorgeous. Uh, is this a pedestal or is this a plinth? No, it's a pedestal, right? A plinth is only, I don't know, crap, someone tell me. Um, but this pedestal that you see, which I think is also a really cool fun fact, is that there are pieces of the stone uh, in this pedestal, fragments of the, of the old stone that came from, no joke, the real Joan of Arc's cell in Rouen, where she was uh, imprisoned shortly before she was executed by the, by the British. Oh, Sorry, I'm getting a Kristen saying, your mic is distorting, your voice is on the loud end. Can you talk softer or turn down the levels? It's a great question. I unfortunately cannot turn down the levels uh, because I don't have any level control on this one. But let me, let me try to like move it a little bit and also try not to be so excited about this, this tour. You guys just get me excited. When I say, let me move this a little bit lower. And it's good for us to get this out of the way early, guys. And I really appreciate, Kristen, uh, you, you saying something because I'd rather fix it than have it be frustrating. So anytime there's a visual or there's a, an auditory issue, please, guys, jump in and say right away, Chris, I don't, take it as a, I don't take it as a criticism. You're helping me if you tell me when something's not working well. 
Um, so, so please do. And, and let me know if the sound level is working now. It could just be, I can see that it's wet a little bit. I wonder if that's messing up the microphone. All right, don't listen for a second. I'm gonna try sucking the water out of this. Well, there was something in there. Gross. Okay, let's see if that works better. If I can get a plus one, as Bernard would say, for good sound now, let me know. And back to the story. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. Appreciate that. Okay, hey, Rebecca Stewart. Greetings. Um, perfect. All right, so back to the story, like we were saying. And I, and I put, the, I put the, you know, the mic further away, so. I don't want to open my jacket too much because I don't want to get soaked. But there it is. All right, great. Let me, you guys keep me knowing whether I'm having problems or not. Like we were saying, so Joan of Arc, who as like a 13 year old child has this, this vision that she's supposed to um, help free France uh, from the occupying British. She comes together, you know, she, 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 she talks about her, her vision having been, having been visited um, by, who was she visited by? I guess like angels or something. Um, or maybe God himself. And um, then, uh, yeah, she goes on this rampage, raising a whole bunch of, you know, French forces. And the British eventually capture her and they end up, they end up killing her, uh, executing her as a heretic because she said that she was talking to God. And, um, and yeah, parts of this, this pedestal here come from Joan of Arc's cell in Rouen. So very neat. Very cool little space. As you can see, I was right. It was erected in 1915. All right, so I, I got that part of it right so far. A um, couple of people have come in and said hi in the meantime. I just want to say hi back to, my, to some of my faves because I didn't say hi to you when you, uh, when you said hi. So, uh, Bar, you were there for a little while ago. I don't know if I said hi to you or not, but hi, Bar. Sorry if I didn't say hello before. You know, Manishma, Makove. Um, and um, Teague, really appreciate you always being there for us. Uh, it's almost like, I, Teague, I never want to take you and Shannon for granted because you can't be taken for granted because you're such dedicated and awesome supporters. But, but it's great to have you, have you join in and, and you're not taken for granted. That's the point. I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, Maria Rita Costa, Buenos Dias in Argentina. I'd like to do another tour of Argentina soon. I hope that really happens. Uh, because I'd, I'd love to be back there again in the not too distant future. Um, and, um, and Rebecca Stewart saw you there, waving back. Boop, 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 boop. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, and Kristen asked stolen artifacts. Um, uh, I don't believe they were stolen artifacts. I think that when they were raising the money to put together that, that statue, part of the, the plan was specifically to, um, to use part of that cell, you know, from Rouen, where she had been, where she had been locked up. So, yeah, we've got some distances to cover as we go. And as you can see, it's still, still coming down. It's a little bit less rainy than it had been in the last chunk of time, but I do expect it to continue to be wet for me. So what am I gonna do? Um, so where am I right now, guys? Let me just tell you uh, real fast. We're in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And let me flip this rather than just talk to you like that. Back to my finger. And we've got a, it's, it feels like a different world up here. And for those of you who have caught the last bit of um, my, my little short vignette tours as we've been going along in the last days, um, you have seen some of this park before, Riverside Park. Now, Riverside Park is on the other side of this road that I'm walking along, which is called Riverside Drive. Um, and this whole area was once a promenade that would, you know, inspire kind of not just, it was sort of like a, if you will, like Times Square of the, uh, of the late 1800s. You'd come up here and ride around in your wagon and stroll around. And now you've got the Henry Hudson Parkway uh, over across the other side there. But you also have gorgeous gorgeous buildings that i'm just going to take a not going to stop too long but all of this was laid out 
um, as part of the commissioner's plan in 1811. Now, the commissioner's plan in 1811 basically said, look, we've got to figure out how we're going to set up New York north of Houston. Um, and, and they decide that they're going to use a grid system. And that grid system went all the way up to, I believe, 125th Street. Um, and they'd laid it all out. But by the, by the, you know, even though that's 1811, it, the building doesn't really start up here until the 18, like much later than that, like I'm going to say 1870s, 1880s. Uh, we're going to see, we're going to see one of that, a mansion that we visited the other day, we're going to go back to, which was uh, built a little bit earlier than that when it was still more farmland. And we also talked about Mount Tom the other day and how uh, Edgar Allan Poe was, was spending time here in the 1840s, right? So by the 1840s, it, this was still all farmland. But 40 years later, by the 1880s, you're starting to develop and have real buildings here. Now, this building, really quick, is worth pointing out. Uh, it is called the Cliff Dwelling. And the Cliff Dwelling, it's pretty cool because it's, it's a little oddly shaped building. Oh, here we go. Uh-oh. I got water on my, on my screen. Clean that up. See if that's better. Yep, yeah, that works, huh? How about finger? Go finger. So the cliff line here um, is, uh, is an interest. I mean, originally it was a hotel um, here in the corner of of Riverside Park and, and West 96th Street, but um, it was not it was not very well well loved inside uh, by residents because there's too many rooms uh, per floor, like five five rooms, like five different apartments adjoining. But what's really cool about it, which I love and really catches my eye, are these motifs along the side, which speak to um, Native American people from the Midwest. And if you if we take a closer look, you can really start to get a feeling of this, which is very, is very neat. Now, uh, higher up some part of this building, there are other symbols. Now, the building built in 1917, remember, 1917 is years before the Nazi party will come into existence. But, oh, did I not? Uh, I didn't copy over a photo. Oh well, it's part of doing things kind of on the fly. But uh, there are somewhere in the facade, there are swastikas. Um, dun dun dun, swastikas. Because swastikas, of course, existed as a symbol for well, thousands of years before the Nazi party ever existed. But cool building. And it must be, it must, must be further up. Yeah, but I'm not gonna be able to show that thing to you. I, I had thought that I had actually gotten that image and put it as to one of the, the pictures I would show you guys using Prism Media, but with the rain, I was a little bit, I was a little bit last minute uh, running up here and getting things going. So um, Nikki asks, is this an affluent area of Manhattan? compared to, say, Alphabet City area, or is it kind of similar? This is definitely a more affluent area of New York, much, much more so. Um, and we'll get a feeling of that as we go, because it really is quite, yeah, affluent. Um, so Alphabet City, Nikki, to answer your question, officially already um, once you cross over Avenue B and you're heading further east of Avenue B, that's an area that's considered um, of, of lo a low income area. So uh, I actually live east of Avenue B and therefore was able to qualify for um, a business loan uh, during the pandemic that I would not have been able to qualify for if I lived west of Avenue B because it's considered an economically depressed zone. This area certainly is not that. Now, if you keep going up further north, past the Upper West Side, past Morningside Heights, and you get up into an area known as Washington Heights, 
towards the um, the uh, George Washington Bridge. Here's another quick look. Oh, look how pretty! Look how pretty those buildings are. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Kristen. I'm just gonna. Should really just like. We're gonna be wiping the lens a bunch of times today. I'll try to hide underneath sidewalk bridges to be able to like get the least rain on us. But you can just see that that the buildings when they were built up here, when they were when they were being constructed, they were adding all these beautiful kind of facade motifs to them that you just don't get downtown the same way um, during that building period already uh, because. The nicer buildings on the Lower East Side, a lot of them were historically built back when it was still like little Germany, Klein Deutschland. And after um, that, that horrible accident on the steamboat in the East River, when the, the General Slocum, as it was known as, uh, it caught on fire as it was transporting um, German American German women and children predominantly who are heading across the river uh, to go to a picnic where the men were waiting for them basically uh, that one of the steamboat engines had caught on fire exploded and a lot of the wealth from the Lower East Side from well not Lower East Side but from Alphabet City area or Klein Deutschland it ends up leaving the area um, and yeah it's a it's a great the great point that Nikki makes is that should I not have a Sandeman New Europe umbrella with me? And if I did, to be smart, I would not be able to refer to my notes for this tour as I was going. And in the end, choosing between having better content or being drier, you just don't entrance ways like this down the Lower East Side. Not, not these beautiful, you know, residential buildings having gorgeous, probably Vermont marble columns there. So yes, this area was very affluent uh, at the time that, that it was, you know, being built up and developed because this was a nice part of the city to end up in, to get, a, get away, if you will, in the 1880s what was going on downtown, which in New York was a big port and industrializing and smoky and smelly and messy. This was an escape out here. You felt like you were in a different world until they build the subway finally and kind of connect things together. So the next place that I want to bring us to here is the Fireman's Monument. And we're going to walk around this space and uh, let me see if I can hide a little bit from the rain just for a second show it to you guys um, and what this monument says here on the on the front of it whoop, let me zoom in for you so you can read it with me if you wish and get a feeling of it um, it says to the men of the fire department of the city of New York who died at the call of duty soldiers in a war that never ends this memorial dedicated by the people of greater oh sorry of grateful uh, of a grateful city. So um, New York, very much like other major cities in, uh, in the US, you know, that were around in the 18th and 19th century, really struggled. Hello, truck. It really struggled with, with fires. Um, and you have a, a massive fire in 1776, which, whoops, a massive fire in 1776, uh, as the British take New York City from Washington's troops and Washington's, you know, is is retreating up the Manhattan Island kind of peninsula, if you will, heading towards the Bronx um, to eventually a battle, which we might get up to to Claremont, um, Claremont Hill or Old Strawberry Hill, where the Battle of Harlem um, took place and, and they, the, the American forces win that one. Um, but, but yeah, no fire. Fire in 1776 was a bad one. Uh, we lost a lot of Lower Manhattan then. Uh, amazingly, um, you know, parts of it are saved. But uh, then again, in the uh, in 
1835 and 1845, we had two other giant fires uh, that swept through the, swept through the city, uh, burning it. And it was a real issue until New York finally builds the Croton River Dam up in Croton, New York, as well as the Croton Aqueduct, which finally brings water, flowing water, down into Manhattan. And that does two great things. It does one thing, it means we get fresh water all of a sudden. Before that, we were drinking like our own, <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of our own body's water uh, because we'd polluted our, our only fresh water drinking spot in, uh, in, you know, on the Manhattan Island. And uh, the other people that are really, really happy about this, this aqueduct were the firefighters because Back before the Croton River Dam and the Croton River Aqueduct, in the winters, the only bodies of water that the firemen could get to would freeze up usually, right? They'd be frozen solids. They'd be using axes to be able to, to get into, um, into that water to be able to like pump it out. Uh, and that, of course, meant that sometimes, especially in the winter, it's pretty hard to put a fire out. Um, so problematic, problematic indeed. This particular uh, memorial is built after a devastating fire in, in um, excuse me, not devastating fire, the devastating loss of, the, uh, of the, the deputy fire chief, Charles W. Kruger, um, who drowned to death in a flooded Canal Street basement. And they, you know, they decided that this was, this was necessary to memorialize those firefighters who were losing their lives to, um, to fire uh, and to accidents related to the fire. So for $40,000 in 1911, uh, and then an additional 50,000 funded through, uh, through local donors, we were able to, to bring, this, bring this here. Originally, they were gonna put it in Union Square downtown around 14th Street, but with Riverside Drive becoming more and more fashionable, and then as Michelle is mentioning right there, uh, You've got these great views out to where you wouldn't have had trees back in the day here, uh, not as many nearly, and you'd be able to see directly out onto the, onto the river. You'd have these great views from slow pan, slow pan, slow pan, slow pan. You'd have these views from these buildings being able to look out across. So this was like a, um, a, a, a haughty toddy, you know, powerful neighborhood um, where a little bit north of here is where the, you know, the Vanderbilts lived and, um, and JP Morgan, you know, lived up around there. So it had influence to be able to pull things together. So we're going to keep on moving, but there's one other, one other quick plaque I want to show you guys. Cause as we look at the front of the firefighters memorial, um, and you see, you know, to the heroic dead of the fire department, we also have another little plaque here, which is, it says this tablet is dedicated to the horses that shared in valor and devotion and with mighty speed bore on the rescue. And that is from the ASPCA uh, who donated this plaque, the American Society for the Preservation of Cruelty to Animals, which is a, a neat thing. Michaela asked a question about um, is that a, a, a dead adult in his mother's arms? And yeah, that's a, that's a great, great uh, question, Michaela, because indeed um, this, this statue uh, done by a gentleman by the name of uh, Pissarelli uh, is often compared to Michelangelo's statue of uh, the grieving Madonna holding, you know, holding her holding holding the guy right holding the big c jc so uh that's exactly what it's what it's in reference to good call Ugh, we got water again sorry about this guys i should have brought a handkerchief or something i'm gonna take this clean this water off real fast okay and we're clean Yeah, prevention. It is not the ASPCA. The P in ASPCA is not for the uh, preservation of animal cruelty. It is definitely the prevention. Oh, guides and their diarrhea mouths. The things that we might say.
So, uh, something else wor worth mentioning, the memorial there that we've just left, uh, as of September 11th, 2001, um, with the loss of the 343 New York firefighters uh, who died in, tragically uh, during the, the mishaps and you know the disaster of September 11th, and the great sacrifice they made. Uh, it's also 11th, while we still have, of course, a, uh, a memorial service down at the old site of uh, the Twin Towers, there's also a memorial service up here at this memorial to firefighters, so, um, which is just pretty neat. More columns. Just like every other building has columns here as you walk up Riverside Drive. You can see all these nice apartments and they're just looking out above these trees and being able to see straight over to, to the water. Happy for them. All right, so next stop, uh, we're headed up to the Gershwin House because what a lot of people may not know is that the Gershwin brothers used to, uh, well, they lived in New York. Uh, they were from Brooklyn, in fact, um, and uh, they lived up here in the Upper West Side for a while in a house that we're going to next, uh, the Gershwin House. They lived here from 1925 till 1931, uh, and they lived right across the hall from each other. And it's in this house that they wrote some of their, you know, real great famous, uh, famous works uh, that came out. Um, Rhapsody in Blue had come out just previous to them moving to this, this apartment space. Probably how they managed to afford to be here. Um, and, uh, but it's while they were in here that they wrote, um, well, American in Paris, Swanee. No, that was earlier. Uh, I Got Rhythm. I Got Rhythm was definitely written while they were in this house. And it's often thought that because the old West Side train tracks, which were still here and not covered until 1937, um, allowed them to, to hear the sounds of the train choo-chooing up and down, as well as all the tugboats, boop, 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 uh, and the rest. So that might very much have influenced that song. Da, 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 da. Here they are. That's right. Gershwin family home. Right here. George Gershwin and Ira Gershwin. Older brother Ira Gershwin outlived George, uh, who died tragically and young. Um, but both of them actually born Gershwitz. Israel Gershwitz became Ira. Uh, and George was originally Jakob Bruskin Gershevitz. So, two American stars. Oh, but look really quick at these gorgeous brownstones over here. I know, I gotta wipe. I'm gonna wipe, I'm gonna wipe. I want you guys to see these, these buildings. Oh, I wish I had a tissue. That is what the inside of my shirt looks like. I can see it's a sun shower now at this point, which is a nice thing. So we, we've got a little bit of sun coming out. How nice are these, these buildings? I was just thinking to myself as I was walking around exploring in the rain the other day, how nice it would be to live up here. <laughs> Food desert, but tons of parking. Oop. Good job. Come on. Show me how you did it. That's awesome. That's the way you do it. It's two. He's a, I mean, I see a future Lance Armstrong, but without the controversy, without the controversy. That little speed rider down there. Um, so Teague asked before, sorry Teague, I saw your question come in because of course I am live direct streaming with you guys. Uh, and you asked, are we going to start in-person tours again, small groups and, and all that kind of jazz? Well, uh, as, as Nikki very kindly shared to the, wor the worldwide community, um, we have already started doing uh, weekend tours in Edinburgh again. Oh, God, feels so good to be back. 
and be working again. Um, and that's just on weekends and just in English, but we're going to keep on expanding that out. In New York, we're thinking May 21st, 22nd, that weekend, that we'll end up, um, we'll end up doing more. more we'll end up doing tours in New York. And then, hey, as soon as we can open anywhere else, we're going to be working. Like, we want to be working. We want to be out there. So right now, uh, yeah, the question of what street I'm on, I'm on West End Ave, walking north, and I'm about to cross 104th Street. So these are not directly on Riverside Park. I've gone in one block just to show you something else that I discovered over here, which I thought was pretty cool. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show it to you guys and give you a little bit of a different perspective. Gene, I love your purple hearts. Always makes me so happy. And Shannon, I hope that whilst you can hear the birds chirping, you're not hearing too much of the, of the cars going by. It's one of the downsides of when it rains is that car tires do get louder. Um, so unfortunately, but now it's quiet again. Generally, the Upper West Side is it's, faint, it's infamously quiet. Um, something that young people despise and older generations appreciate. And as Michelle was saying before, uh, we often do see the doorman. Hello. See, doorman. The doorman of the upper buildings. Although, when I first moved to New York, I lived in a big building with lots of people and there was a doorman. It was just a doorman for like 100 of us that lived inside the space more than really 200 of us, but yeah. All right, let's see Teague, fashionable doorman on the left. Yeah, that's right. Tom Holland, right, exactly Teague. Uh, and Michelle writes, uh, Babe Ruth lived in my grandparents' building at 110 Riverside Drive, 83rd Street. Yeah, it's about, yeah, about 20, about 20 blocks south of us right now. I thought about starting that far down, um, especially because I was running late on time and I wanted to make sure that I got as much covered as, you know, I, I didn't want to start late. There's something in me which is like better to start unready than start late. But um, I ended up making it up on an electric bike. The e-bikes, the city bike e-bikes, which give you a little bit of pedal assist power, are brilliant, but much like a taxi in New York, they're hard to find as soon as it starts to rain because everyone would rather have an e-bike when it's coming down. And now the rain is out, but it's actually sunny as well, which is quite lovely. You know what's funny? These people were all sitting on this bench for the last two days when I came by here as well, and they're still there. Okay. So uh, we're heading into Strauss Park, which is a park I'd never been to before the other day. So even though this is not my first time discovering the park, it, it is maybe for many of you guys, your first time discovering the park. So I'm gonna take it nice and slow as we walk in. Even though we're in one of these weird little nooks created by the, uh, un, like the, the unregular Broadway, is, whereas the rest of the city is in this grid system, Broadway, which is this 13 mile long road, 11 miles of it being here in Manhattan, uh, was the old Lenape people, the Native Americans who were here before the Dutch showed up. Uh, it was the, their old path that would take them they didn't live on Manahata or Manhattan. They lived north of here for the most part. They used Manhattan as a hunting grounds and as a place to go and harvest uh, oysters down from the south of Manhattan uh, or Manahata. And um, Broadway, because it is this weird, weird diagonal shape, um, or often curves back and forth, it creates inside the grid these little kind of triangular spaces. Times Square is one of those areas which is kind of carved out and carved together by, um, by uh, Broadway, as well as Herald Square and many, many other places. Uh, I, Jill, you can come whenever you want to. You're welcome 
to watch this playback or live, but I'm so happy to have you with us live. Are you still out in, are you still out in the, the Pacific Northwest or uh, are you back in, are you back in Zona already? I'd love to know. Tell me in the chat. Uh, and guys, as always, tell me in the chat if you cannot hear me or you cannot see or anything like that. So this sculpture that we're looking at right now um, is a bronze from 1913 by the American artist Augustus Lukeman. And it's a nymph gazing over the calm expanse of water in memory of the people who this park is actually named after. It's a husband and wife, and their name were, names were Ida and Isidore Strauss. It's gorgeous, right? And there's a little plaque, or not plaque, but an inscription here to them, which um, in the rain might be hard for you guys to read on this bench, but I'm going to read it for you. It says, in memory of Isidore and... Uh, Ida Strauss, who were lost at sea in the Titanic uh, disaster, um, April 15th, 1912. Lovely, uh, lovely and pleasant were they in their lives and in their death, uh, they were not divided. That's actually a biblical quote uh, from from 11 Samuel um, 123. And yeah, Titanic, exactly. Uh, it's the Titanic because these guys died in the RMS Titanic accident. Um, they were, they lived just about a block south of here where we are right now, uh, between 105th and 106th uh, on Broadway. And uh, before that, this park was, was actually called Bloomingdale Park, but ended up becoming Strauss Park um, because they were, uh, they were, you know, they were notables. Um, Isidore was a congressman and also a part or a, a co-owner of Macy's. Um, but, but when given the option, and this is really like the key takeaway from the story, when given the option, Ida, who was there on the Titanic with Isidore, was, was being hurried away and people were saying, come on, Ida, you got to go. Women and children are hopping into the lifeboats, Ida said, no. Ida said, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna die on this boat with my husband. So they went down together. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible story, actually. Uh, she could have chosen to go, but she stayed. I find that just incredible dedication. Um, so, yeah, special stuff. Ida and Isidore, the Strauss, the Strausses, in Strauss Park. So, oh, Teague says uh, he's just connected those dots and he was a, he's a huge Titanic buff, yeah. Hey guys, how's it going? Staying dry? Fazley, it looks like you guys got the dry spots somehow. You know where to hide out. Out of this tree, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Have a good day. Nice people. Whoop. Crossing illegally, Chris. Okay, so. People up here are pretty friendly. It's much more of a, you get a much more of a community feeling on the Upper West Side because it's so much less touristic. Um, so people that are up here are usually up here for a purpose because like they live here or they're working up here, or they're visiting, you know, people up here, but not so much. It doesn't, it doesn't have that same draw as Midtown and Lower Manhattan. So it's also neat that you guys get to come and explore it a little bit with us right now. Go look at all these be beautiful buildings. And we're heading now back west, heading back towards Riverside Drive and Riverside Park again. Gives you guys a feeling of where we are. And um, we're going to learn a little bit about General Franz Siegel. So General Franz Siegel was and this is for you, Michaela, right? Here it comes. Uh, he was born on November 18th, 1824 in Schinsheim, in Baden. Uh, he completed his studies at the Gymnasium of Brüssel and graduated from the Military Academy of Karlsruhe in 1843, right? And he became Lieutenant in the, the Grand Ducal Service. However, that being said, he was not a very conservative guy. He had pretty progressive and liberal views. Um, and the existing regime wasn't happy with them. So uh, 
there was an unsuccessful revolution in 1848, um, and uh, he fled after being part of that, and he ended up in Switzerland. And from Switzerland, he traveled in exile to England in 1851, until finally, a year later, he ended up in the United States. He settled in New York City, he taught German in public schools, and he co-founded the German American Institute. Um, now, think about the year, 1852. What's going to happen in 1861? Uh-oh, Civil War, right? So um, he had already been part of, you know, he already had the military background, the military training, um, and he ended up being part of the 5th New York Militia until he moved to St. Louis in 1857, just in time for the American Civil War to start up by 1861. He was integral, actually, uh, in helping keep the Missouri um, federal arsenal in the hands of the Union. Whereas, like, when we were down in Charleston, we learned that the federal armory down there ended up in the hands of the Confederacy. Oh, no, oh, Siegel is the guy right here. Good old Franz. Hey, Franzi. Um, he's the guy in his equestrian statue here who does such good work to help keep Missouri uh, and the Missouri arsenal in the hands of, of the Union. Um, he raised himself to uh, the, the rank of Major General and uh, he was instrumental in both the campaigns of Pea Ridge and the Second Battle of Bull Run. Second Battle of Bull Run uh, was one of those big ones, or one of those massive loss of life ones in the, in the Civil War. So pretty cool guy. Um, he finally dies in 1902 uh, at a ripe old age, so uh, survives through the Civil War, and, uh, uh, and uh, here he is, now immortalized as one of the statues that stares out from Riverside Drive across into Riverside Park. can almost get a, get a feeling. This is pretty much Francie's, Francie's view. Yeah, neat. Okay, whoop. You guys are gonna run the stop sign and I'm gonna keep on walking. Okay, so for those of you guys who, uh, yeah, Michaela, wow, you're very welcome. It just goes to show, which, which I think a lot of Americans tend to forget, the massive, massive influence uh, and of German heritage that the U.S. has, and in uh, people often don't even realize this. And I, when I was a guide in Berlin, I'd often go up to Germans and I'd ask them, "Do you know why 1871 is such an important year in German history?" And they'd be like, "Huh, no, Chris, I have no idea. Why is it so that 1871 is such an important year for us German peoples?" And I was like, "Because 1871 is when Germany is actually founded as a country." Before 1871, Germany was a collection of all these different kingdoms and princedoms and fiefdoms. And it's finally then that it all kind of comes together. But in the mid 1800s, Germany was a battleground for a lot of other big European forces uh, or you know, kingdoms and countries. And, and uh, they tromped all over Germany. So lots of Germans ended up moving to the US uh, in order to have a better life and a, a, and a different start. So, We've been here before. If you watch my videos, my shorts the other day, I'm just going to quickly uh, give you a, a quick, a quick look at this cool building in case you missed it the other day. This is none other than the Shinese mansion and the Shinese mansion was commissioned by Morris Shinese in 1909. Um, it is a very neat building because, and I won't take too long on it because I will tell you to go and watch the video, which is specifically on the Shinese. Uh, you know, the Shinese, uh, excuse me, the video on the Shinese mansion itself. But what's so cool about this building is that it is the only remaining freestanding single family home in Manhattan. There are no other buildings that are single family homes and not connected to any other building, right? You notice the walls are all separate. So each side of this building has its own design. It's all unique, pretty neat. So uh, Morris Shinese, the guy who builds this, he was a tobacco baron by, by his later years. But when he first comes to the US in 1890, he'd come with only $25,000 that he'd borrowed from a very good friend, because $25,000 was a lot of money back then. And he brought with him a machine 
that would completely change his fortunes as well as the fortunes of many smokers. Because before Shinezi, if you wanted to have a cigarette, you had to roll it by hand. Shinezi is the guy that invented the cigarette rolling machine. And like, I'm happy for him because he built this beautiful home, but also people would have smoked a lot less cigarettes maybe if they hadn't started rolling them in a machine. Anyway, someone was gonna invent that. Um, and in 1893, he shows that cigarette machine uh, to a bunch of people at the Columbian Exposition held in Chicago. Uh, Columbia, Colombian, often comes up and resurfaces again in American language because uh, of Columbus, Christopher Columbus, and not that people think of Christopher Columbus every time they say it, it was just the, the, the name that started to take shape around the 13 colonies, that this was Columbia, it was not part of Britain, it was a new place. They were trying to figure out United States and that would eventually come and replace it. But Columbia was sort of a, an earlier name for the United States, if you will, or this area of land. Anyway, um, this huge, building. It is gigantic at 12,000 square feet. It has an entertainment and service rooms in the basement uh, and the first floor. There's a gym inside there, um, servants quarters, dining rooms, galleries, waiting areas, two parlor rooms. The second and third levels contain bedrooms, bathrooms, sitting areas, kitchens, and if you go all the way to the top floor there's even a studio apartment up there. In fact, um, this English basement down below below see there's another kind of level down there like there's a, a there's an apartment area at the bottom of the building and um, there was a old tunnel that would run from there back to the river which they think was maybe also used during prohibition to smuggle booze in and out of the building but it would have been a direct connection underground underneath the park down to uh, the, uh, the Hudson River uh, side there so since 19, so excuse me, since 2013, the building has been owned by Mark Schwartz, a Goldman Sachs executive. He purchased the building for $14 million, which is a shade more than um, good old Chinese uh, paid William Tuttle to build the building uh, back, in, uh, back in 1903 when he moved in here with his, uh, after he'd made his fortune. Uh, and moved in with his wife. So you can see again, this is probably actually the, the prettiest side of the building, I think. And you can see the copper, um, the, you know, the, the greening copper uh, runoff there, this kind of marble protruding, and then also that next level of floor. I shouldn't put my arm probably too close to the other side, but I think this is a really neat little, a really neat little space. So cool, I'm glad you guys liked that. I'm glad you enjoyed that. We're going to keep on moving. We've got a little bit of, of walking in front of us. It's always, I, I wanted to research this building as well because I thought this was really pretty. Uh, and it's a historic space at 353 Riverside. But I didn't get a chance to do a proper research on it. You can always tell though, right? Any building in New York which isn't built that tall, and this one's not built that tall, and the Shinezi Mansion isn't built that tall, Whenever you have buildings that aren't built that tall, it means that whoever built them had some money. They had cash um, because property in New York is expensive and you want to build up. You want to you want to take advantage of that that first floor that you have, which is like the property itself. You you own that ground floor. So you might as well build up as high as you can so you can rent as many apartments above, 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 above until you finally you know, you're really monetizing your space. But if you've got lots of cash, you don't have to worry about that, right? Um, because, uh, so you build, shows how much you have. Manhattan, um, and the New York Stock Exchange, you have the old JP Morgan building, and it is only one and a half stories tall surrounded by giant buildings. Now, J.P. Morgan was around in the late 1800s, and uh, his, you know, his whole, his whole pitch was that uh, he was so wealthy he could build a short building. He didn't need it to be a big building. Today, that building, no longer owned by J.P. Morgan, who's been dead for a long time, um, is really difficult to rent out because it is so expensive 
because it is so short. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So where am I right now? Let me just ask the internet. I know where I am. All right, we're about to hit Broadway again. And, uh, and then we're gonna head up to one of my favorite little pastry shops, uh, the Hungarian pastry shop, which um, actually has a really good, uh, has really good poppy seed desserts. Moren, there's Moren pastries. We'll let this guy go. And then we're gonna cross the street. And it's safe and we're going. So how are you guys doing? Is this, is this okay so far? Are you guys having an okay time? I was a little bit self-conscious about this one uh, because I haven't practiced it and you're really the first people I'm ever saying these words out loud to, which makes me a little bit concerned that I might suck. Uh, but uh, you know what they say, as long as the actor never tells you that uh, the scenery wasn't supposed to fall over in the background. Everyone thinks it's part of the play. So, <laughs> let me see some plus ones if you're having a good time. That's what I need. Let me know, let me know. Teague writes, I love Budapest and will return next year uh, to start a river cruise with my mom. That's a really cool idea, especially considering Mother's Day is coming up um, so soon. What a nice gift for your mom. We're gonna go do a river cruise together, Ma. How about that? That's really neat. Okay, thank you, Diana. I appreciate that. So we're at Broadway and we're about to hit Cathedral Parkway and we're gonna turn down Cathedral Parkway and, uh, and make our way over to the Hungarian pastry shop, over to the Peace Fountain, and also over to none other than the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. And those are what's coming up for us next. We're just about to hit an hour, so I'm not gonna dilly-dally too long there, because I wanna get us up to Columbia. I fear that we might have to allow Grant's tomb to be a different visit for us to get up there into Riverside Church as well. The good news is that it's not raining anymore, which makes me really happy, so because uh, I'm, I'm starting to dry out. i even show you guys. Oh, great. Thank you, Michaela. I appreciate the support. You know it means the world. Red light. And we're crossing the street. West Side Market. I had some breakfast tacos today, but I do feel a little peckish again. The 40 minute bike ride up here. Even though I was using the electric, I was pounding away myself. Mmm. Yes, my favorite bagels, poppy seed, Diana writes. I'm an everything bagel kind of guy. The West Side Meeting House. Look at that. Huh. Very cool. I actually did not walk this way before. I hadn't seen this before, but I can see the Star of David in the, in the window there, in the, the uh, stained glass, and some, uh, some Hebraic writing there as well. What did I learn from Jim Gresham back in Charleston was that meeting house, as we can see, there's actually another name for a religious institution back when it couldn't be called necessarily a church, maybe it's called a house. Neat. Sorry, just, just picking up random stuff as we go. Always worth it. Always worth taking a quick look. So we're crossing east right now on 110th Street. Another doorman building. It's a co-op, looks like. Infamous New York institutions, the co-ops. Great to, great to have a co-op apartment. 
difficult to rent them. Very picky, those co-op boards sometimes. I love these little nooks in these, in these buildings. How they kind of recess in to allow everyone to have an apartment with some light. Isn't that neat? Yeah, you know, Teague asks me if I could talk more about how a co-op works. I'm living in a co-op apartment right now, and um, it's like, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, people who also know more about co-ops than I do, but it's like the co-op itself is its, it's its own little kingdom. And the co-op board can make a lot of decisions um, without having a, a tremendous amount of oversight from other like ombudsmen or government institutions. Um, and they, you know, they set the rules and they run the, the building like a business a little bit that they have to keep it afloat and, and manage, the, manage the building. Um, my experience of it is that once the co-op says, this is the way we're gonna run it, like that's it. You know, unless you get board approval, there's not much you can, you can do uh, in a co-op. Um, but I have a really, great landlord right now uh this guy named danny super super nice guy um bought the apartment in the wraparound apartment for next to nothing in the late 1970s or early 80s i believe he paid like 500 dollars for both spaces but back then there was a pigeon colony living inside the apartment space because it wasn't an apartment it was just like like a gutted out space and, and it's hard to imagine the the 1970s here in New York, uh, it, they were bad. Um, New York had been a leading port city for so long that it had extended its dominance on international trade because of the building of the Erie Canal, which um, had, you know, DeWitt Clinton had set up to connect uh, New York all the way through to the Great Lakes, to Lake Erie through this canal, which was at the end of the Hudson River. And um, if you wanted to ship something from London to Chicago, you'd have to go through New York. And that was all true until the 60s. Because in the 60s, you have the superhighways coming in. And those superhighways just, um, they, they crush New York. So, all right, here we are, the Hungarian pastry shop. This place is great. If you come to New York, you gotta come to the Hungarian pastry shop. It's such an awesome mix of folks because you've got Columbia students here, you've got tourists, uh, excuse me, travelers who are visiting, uh, who are coming in. Um, and I'm gonna get a little bit closer and just show you guys the window without stressing these guys, um, these guys out. But this place is an institution. It's been here since 1961, uh, opened by a Hungarian Jewish immigrants. It's a simple kitchen and really just like a, a dining counter. But now um, being here since the 60s, it is, it is this true institution. And uh, the rum balls are especially delicious. Let's see if we can't get close and take a quick look in without getting in trouble. Yes. yes. Happy people outside enjoying their food. But you know, we're running low on time, so we can't just look at the Hungarian pastry shop. Um, let's cross over here. This is neat. They've, they've blocked off the street here. That's nice. That's nice. And um, let's take a look at this thing. The Peace Fountain. Yeah, Hungarian Pastry Shop. It's uh, West 111th in Amsterdam is where that is. Mark it down. All right. This used to be open, but it's not anymore. It's always kind of closed. Um, bar, as I'm showing you guys the... Just take a, take a stare at this really quick. Uh, at the, the Peace Fountain. All right, great. Um, Bar, what kind of food is in there? They're famous for their pastries, especially their croissants. Um, but I have to admit, I've really enjoyed their strudel, although they put raisins in the strudel, which isn't the best choice, to be honest with you. You don't really need raisins in your strudel. Um, but they have really good strudels, uh, different types of strudels, like a mon strudel, They've got like a kirsch strudel, like a cherry strudel, um, like the poppy seed strudel, the, you know, apple, apple strudel. Um, and then um, they do all sorts of cookies and 
Uh, it's mostly sweet, not savory as much. Uh, but, and then they've got these rum balls, which are just like, just absolutely delicious. They do baklava as well, um, which always reminds me, every time I say baklava, I always think of that Peyton Oswalt um, uh, sketch, sky cake, which I'll, I'll do next time I've got a space for you guys and I've got nothing else to talk about. So the Peace Fountain right here depicts the struggle of good and evil. And this is actually who you see here in the big fight um, is none other than our favorite archangel, Michael, and uh, he's, he's going up against Satan. So um, this sculpture was done as part of one of the artist in residence uh, work here at, the, uh, at none other than the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, which has lots and lots of artists in residence. Some of them are sculptors, some of them are um, you know, painters or uh, writers. Uh, Madeline, Madeline, what's her last name? Madeline de Engel? who wrote the Wrinkle in Time series. She was actually one of the, one of the artists in residence at the, at the cathedral here as well. She's actually, she's a, she, was, she had her, her burial ceremony at this church, which is behind the Peace, um, the peace Fountain, uh, as did Nikola Tesla, uh, Jim Henson of the Muppets, uh, and many other famous people who we, who we all love. But um, the story that we're looking at here in the Peace Fountain is is celebrating this triumph of good over evil um, and it's speaking also about all the different kind of opposing forces that you have throughout um, throughout life violence and harmony light and darkness life and death um, and the the idea is that in the end of all of that god reconciles this in his peace um, when the fountain usually operates which it hasn't been doing for a while you have four courses of water that kind of cascade down the the freedom pedestal into a maelstrom um, evoking the primordial chaos of earth and you can kind of see where that water would cascade down down in that kind of space and then the crab claws the crab representing rebirth um, and you know the circle of life so bye peace fountain nice to see you Let's go talk about St. John's, uh, the Cathedral of St. John's the Divine instead, because it is a masterpiece. And also, actually, the, um, the largest single, the largest church in, in New York City. Uh, and one of the, the largest uh, in the world. It's often not just called St. John, the Cathedral of St. John's the Divine. It's often called uh, St. John's the Unfinished because despite having been at it for a good long time, uh, it is still not yet completed. It's only about two thirds of the uh, proposed building has actually been finished. Oop, let me just zoom out a little bit here. There we go. Yes, Teague, you do. You, just because you drive by on a double-decker bus does not mean you've seen it. You got to get out uh, and give it a proper view. Now I can go in and visit, but they charge me if I'm not there to pray. And the the camera the camera does give away that I'm I'm doing something more than maybe just that. Um, so started in 1892, there were a lot of a lot of changes that take place inside of this building. Originally, um, the the original construction, the plan was to have a, a sort of a mix of a Byzantine revival and Romanesque revival style. But by the time that the, um, the original architects, well, start to, one of them, one of them dies, um, uh, as does the bishop at the time, by then it's, we're looking at the early 1900s, like 1907 is when those big changes take place. And they decide by 1907, now that this building's been kind of under construction already for 15 years, that they, um, they that Gothic architecture has come into real uh, vogue in New York. So the crazy thing about this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, church is that that it's it's a mix of both of both this kind of Romanesque and Byzantine revival styles. But then the plans change by 1909. Uh, and, and they move towards a Gothic revival style instead. Uh, so if you wonder if I did, I download that one. Let me see. I did. 
How about that? I don't know, but it's, I got it in the wrong shape. Did that just show up for you guys? Can you kind of see that, what I've just posted into this? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But I've just tried to show you an overhead picture of this building. Um, I'm, I'm standing way down at the bottom, like down this end, you know, over here, looking at the entrance, the main entrance. Um, but you can see up here where it kind of crosses, right? This is the middle part where there's a big kind of flat circle right there where my fingernail is kind of going. Um, that is actually the largest tiled dome roof anywhere in the world. And it wasn't supposed to be what was gonna go there. It was supposed to be a massive Gothic tower. But, uh, you know, they really struggled because 1909, 1911, um, they, they have new plans and they're gonna be doing the Gothic style. Instead, they bring in um, a new, like seriously Gothic loving architect. Uh, and they, they, they hit 1914. And what happens in 1914? You've got World War I. By 1918, you know, the construction is dragging, it's taking some time, uh, and they finally connect, they start to connect the crossing in here, this, this crossing space, that middle section. Um, and you can see though, at the same time, that part of it is still not connected. Like this part of the building hasn't been kind of finished uh, on it. And in 1911, they actually, there's a, a Rochester newspaper article that says, look, you know, like cathedrals take a long time to build. No one expects them to be built in a day. They, they take their time. Let me get rid of this, this thing from the screen now so you can just see the, the cathedral, huh? Okay. They take their time to get built. And in 1911, this Rochester newspaper, the leading paper of Rochester said, we expect it to be completed, you know, in the next 50 years, which would have been 1961. I mean, it's like 60 years ago, right? So by no means were they accurate. It still is going to take uh, a long time. Now, uh, a lot of people have donated money to this um, uh, Episcopalian uh, cathedral. Uh, cathedral does not mean that you have to be Catholic, BTW, uh, for those who don't know. It just means that you have a bishop, right? That's where the, the seat of the bishopry is. And when St. Patrick's Cathedral ends up moving and being built in Midtown, um, over, you know, near the New York Public Library and Bryant Park and, you know, Fifth Avenue and all of that, um, the, the Anglican, or excuse me, the Episcopalians say, hey, you know, we, we, we need something as well. Um, we want to have a big church to, to represent ourselves. Now, used to be, I made a mistake and I corrected myself, I said Anglican to start with because the Episcopalian church in the U.S. was Anglican to begin with up until this magic year of 1783. Because 1783, for all of you history buffs, well, it's the end of the Revolutionary War, the American War of Independence. And the, uh, everything that was British at that point was no longer good. So they changed King Street and Queen Street and, and Prince Street, and they started naming them, well, Prince Street actually remained, but King Street and Queen Street, they changed to Fur and Spruce and Liberty Street, things like that downtown. Um, and they also get rid of the Anglican Church uh, and instead install the, the Episcopalian Church, which would, Episcopalians, I guess, would call themselves Cath Catholic with a small C, if you will. Not Catholics, but kind of in that direction. Um, this church itself is both at the same time very traditional and uh, and conservative. It's, it's both in some ways. Uh, excuse me, traditional, conservative, but then also very liberal is what I mean to say. It's both liberal and conservative. And, and that is in the sense that, well, they're still Episcopalians, which is like Catholic light, but they also have a, a lot of really forward thinking um, missions and agendas, like these artists in residence um, that they have. So why don't we, uh, you've kind of got a feeling of it. You can see the big rose window structure there. That's not added until the 1930s. Um, if you can think about that, 1930s, not the, 1933 actually, I believe, 31 or 33, um, that that gets added in. Not exactly the best time to be building things because of course, 1929 is the beginning of, uh, well, it's when the US stock market crash takes place and also results in well, the beginning of the depression. So very hard to get things still built during those days, and yet still the church has been able to push it through. And part of that is because it's not just Episcopalians or old Anglicans that are funding the building of this, this gigantic 
edifice. Um, it's everyone in New York from other denominations are giving money as well. And you might be asking why? Why would they be doing that? Well, when the building starts to get built, the late 1890s, or the early 1890s, the, the end of the 1800s, right? It's during this city beautiful movement in New York where the city is trying to make itself uh, prettier, more attractive, not just industrial and residential, but adding things that they believe will actually improve the civic values and civic morals of the people that live here and reside uh, in, in New York City. So other faiths were donating money as well so that New York would have this beautiful building, but also it was going, it is the biggest church in New York City. And when it was built, it was uh, arguably the, the biggest church in the world. In fact, today it is the either the largest or the second largest Anglican slash Episcopalian church uh, in the world. So let's get a little bit closer really quick so you guys can take more of a, uh, of a peekaboo of some of the finer works uh, and sculptures that are inside here. And I can only say that this level of detail, that if you can look at the, the statues themselves have then small carvings below the statues that this is not just the exterior of the building. The interior of the building is just as uh, ornate and, and diverse as well, with all sorts of naves and break-off spaces, but also a really weird and amazing mixture of, um, Kristen Curry writes, civic morals, that's one thing we should hold on to as best as we can, yeah, ain't that the truth. Um, but inside because of the the evolution of this cathedral which you know they started building more than a hundred years ago right 18 talking about 130 years ago still not done the building uh, the architects uh the the money behind it has changed and evolved as well so um hence you have all these different styles of building inside of the space which is which is really, uh, which is really interesting. Yeah. Let's see. What if we, what if we try to just stick our head in? Let's see if we get kicked out right away. Oh, give it a go. And then we're going to beeline up to Columbia, guys, because we've gone too long. And I, I'm not trying to, to bore you here. Let's just see. Stay safe. Oh yeah, he was waiting there for me. He saw me a mile away. He was like, you go ahead and you try that. You try to come in here, man. And, uh, and, and fair enough, as it should be, as it should be, people should be paying to go in and see that place. Uh, and yes, Kristen, that's a great idea. A short video later on makes a lot of sense. I'll pay the five dollars, uh, which I'm very happy to uh, to give to them, and then we'll we'll go back in and give it another another view view. All right. Well, why don't we head down here really quick? Um. So. Whoop. Yeah, thank you, class. I tried, right? And there is more to see right now, Kristen, you're right. Um, so let me just tell you something about myself. I, I left the States um, in 2003, and uh, uh, 2002, three, and then moved to Berlin, moved to Germany, and ended up staying there for a long time. I mean, my, half my life, well, more than, less than half my life now, but, when I moved back to the U.S. in 2014-15, I'd spent half my life in Europe and half my life in the U.S. And hence, 
I have this weird um, experience, cultural experience, growing up between different different cultures and different uh, you know different people and uh, and especially different TV and what you'd watch, right? So as a kid, I'd watch Thundercats. I love Thundercats; they're amazing, right? But then when children talk about TV shows that came in the early uh, 2000s, I have no idea about those shows because they just weren't there when, when I was watching TV. I was, I was learning about, you know, Der Sandmann and, and that Schlaftrupp from, from Austin. <laughs> like, I, I, I was in Germany and I was watching German TV and, and learning about German culture and European stuff. So, so I missed a lot of it. And I, one of the things that I missed out on was Seinfeld. I just never got into Seinfeld because it just wasn't something that was around for me. Friends. I never watched Friends, really. And so now, like, I go back to it and I'm like, huh. And I sit around with a bunch of people my age, people in their, their, their early 40s or late 30s, and they say, oh, oh, Seinfeld and Friends. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't feel it as much. But I respect it, even if I didn't learn it myself. So are there any Seinfeld people here. Anyone here that watched Seinfeld? Any fans of Seinfeld at all? Maybe. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say Seinfeld? It might just be that you're like, we've never even heard of that too, Chris. We were with you in Europe that whole time. Well, if you do know Seinfeld, this is for you right now. Because we are going to, we're going to Tom's restaurant, which is where the Seinfeld diner was. Uh, yeah, Michaela, I don't watch Friends. Rebecca Stewart, you don't really watch much TV anyway, I think. Um, so I can imagine you also not being a huge Seinfelder. Ah, Diana. So you've probably already been here. And it's just convenient for us because as we head up to Columbia University and make our, and make our swing up there, um, we get to see this cool little restaurant, which is none other than the restaurant, which is part of the opening scene to every Seinfeld show. Yeah, bar, it's making sense, you're recognizing it. There it is. So the actual show, Seinfeld, wasn't filmed here at all. It's filmed on a studio lot, I believe, in LA. Um, but the exterior shot was from here. And um, it's still one of those great New York institutions, the diner. So, alive and kicking. Crazily enough, that restaurant gets a ton of business from people that are Seinfeld fans. They love it. They love going there uh, to like, you know, wear Kramer and Jerry and Norm. Is that his name? No. Stan. Stan? Stan? Costanza? Something? The guy with the big wallet? Yeah, I gotta go watch Seinfeld too. Klaus, you and me both. We'll go, we'll go check it out. Uh, but um, the owner of the restaurant suddenly got this huge hit of business. And I was like, it's so weird. All these people are showing up all of a sudden. He became really popular. Apparently, according to local legend, he has still himself never watched one episode of Seinfeld, despite the fact that he is the restaurant on Seinfeld, uh, which is which is pretty cool. Ah, uh, George Costanza, that's it. Man with the wallet. Very cool, very cool. All right, well look, we're now walking up Broadway. We're high up on Broadway now. If you've watched our videos from back when we were at like Bowling Green and the Charging Bull uh, from back in the day with Walter, that part of Broadway is a solid nine miles away from where we are right now, or eight miles away, it's far. It's not close to us. We're way uptown at 114th Street right now. And we're heading over to Columbia University. So we actually, believe it or not, already passed a bunch of Columbia University buildings, but they were residential buildings. Uh, they were dorms over on Riverside Drive. Now we're gonna be heading over to where the actual Columbia University is. Check out some more of that. Ah. Thank you, you're right. Norm is from Sam's Bar. Totally. Norm, everybody knows your name. I want to go where the people go. People I do to do. I want to go. Oh, wait, that's Cheers. Yeah, that is Cheers. Exactly right. 
Sam's Bar and Cheers. You know why I have a, I just wanna, here's a quick survey question for the crowd, right? Laugh tracks, laugh tracks. Do you like them? I can't, I can't do laugh tracks. That's my, that's my issue. If a show has got to put a laugh track in to let me know that it's supposed to be funny at that point, I don't know. It breaks my heart. I'd rather just laugh because I think it's funny. But if you're going to be like, ah, ha, 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 I don't know. I'm not so sure. And Friends is a laugh track show. I would rather that sometimes jokes bomb. It's fine. They're supposed to. You know, and sometimes they work. Sometimes they work for some people, right? Yes, Shannon, thank you. No to laugh tracks. No to laugh tracks. And if you say no to laugh tracks, it's hard to say yes to friends. That's, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not a hater. I'm a lover of all shows, of everything. But Kristen, yeah. that's four now for, for friends. I think you've written friends like three times yourself. I don't think you can count those. <sighs> ah, enough of me. Let's go to Columbia University. Dun, dun, dun. Here's a name that we know, Pulitzer. Pulitzer, the Pulitzer Prize. In fact, Pulitzer Prize is uh, awarded um, at Columbia University. The Pulitzer Prize for Journalism starts at the Journalism School here at Columbia. Are you guys ready to go in? Should we just call it quits right now or should we go into the Columbia University campus and take a look really quick? Come on, let's go take a look real fast. Security guard giving me a friendly wave. Always good news. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, Kristen. I think maybe you voted once on Facebook or once on YouTube. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, okay, Columbia University, here we are. Uh, often also just known as Columbia uh, on its own. We just talked about Columbia a second ago, didn't we? And about how Columbia, Columbus, was a name for, um, you know, for America. Originally, this university was not called Columbia, though. It was called King's College. And what did we learn about the Anglicans and the Episcopalians? There was this magical date in the 1780s, 1783, when the British finally lost the war. And when they did lose the war, everything started to change. In King's College, which had been originally um, set up by uh, King George II of Great Britain, given the a royal charter, um, King's College, which had been down by Trinity University, uh, Trinity University, excuse me, by Trinity Church, um, which was again an Anglican church uh, down on Broadway and Wall Street, uh, it's where they'd originally set up. They um, they ended up changing their name in 1784 a year after the end of the war, the year after the final Brits leave uh, on evacuation day and head out from New York Harbor to return back to Great Britain. And um, the, the new name becomes Columbia University. They actually uh, move at that point up to around Midtown today in the, in the 50s, I believe, uh, until eventually shifting all the way up here to this far, far northern uh, location, which was um, on the the borders of the the Bloomingdale uh, Insane Asylum, um, which had this property. But you know, back then, there was really nothing. There was really nothing here uh, as the as the campus moved in 1896 to this area. Now, what I'm looking at, you guys. Hey, Sebel McMiller, you're very very welcome. Happy for you to be here. Awesome. Um, what I'm looking at here is Butler Library. Now, Butler Library is named after the longest serving uh, president of this university, um, which is kind of, kind of amazing. Uh, his was Nicholas Murray Butler. He served from 1902 until 1945. Think about that. He was the president of Columbia University for 43 years. And he was both, by the end of his time, you know, reviled in some ways, but also um, heralded as a, as a great man. Um, he was friends with presidents. Many of them had gone to university here. And this is the main library of the campus here. Uh, inside, there's over two million volumes. 
And above these gorgeous columns, you can see the names of famous thinkers from Homer to Plato, Cicero, Virgil. And that's where most studying gets done here. And we'll spin ourselves around through this gorgeous campus. Now, a lot of the buildings here at Columbia were built uh, by an architecture firm called McKim, Mead and White. And these three partners of this law firm, I mean law firm, phew, architecture firm, uh, were, um, this is the largest collection on this campus, is the largest collection of their buildings in any one, in any one place. They really had a, a heyday with it. Um, and also because of the, the time period that we're talking about when a lot of this was being originally built, not Butler Hall, Butler Hall, excuse me, Butler Library up there, that doesn't come until the 1930s. Um, that kind of, you know, neoclassical style that you have there, more stripped down than what you'd have in other parts of the campus, which would be more uh, of the Beaux-Arts style, which we would have seen. Now, this building that we're looking at is the most famous of the Columbia University buildings, I'd argue, as having not been a Columbia person myself. Uh, as you guys know, I went to a different Ivy League uh, called Yale University, which ironically has a connection to Columbia because um, a man that gave a lot of money to both Yale and to Columbia went to both of them, um, and his name was Harkness, Edward Harkness. Edward Harkness, actually, who donated the tower at Yale University, Harkness Tower, um, donated a lot of the money for the, um, the, the Butler Library, but he also went to um, law school here. He was a Columbia Law School graduate. So he went to his prep school, his high school uh, at St. Paul's, which was an inferior uh, prep school where a friend of mine now works in New Hampshire. Uh, and then he went after that to Yale for his undergraduate and then finally to, to Columbia. But you know who else went to Columbia University? Not that fire truck going by. Let me show you who else went to Columbia University. Boom! This guy. Let me get that picture nice for you. Is that sharp? Can you see this? Here, why don't we just move, why don't we move him? Come on, move him over to the side. All right. That guy there that you're looking at uh, on the left, who's dressed up in his, his cap and gown, is none other than my grandfather. That's right, my granddad. Uh, my mother's father graduated from Columbia University, both, from, both as an undergraduate, but then also from the medical school uh, as a dentist. And he is standing next to his pop-pop, my great-grandfather, who was a first-generation Italian-American. Um, the guy on the right, you know, my, my great-grandfather, his parents had both come over on boats from Italy uh, and set up over on Riverside Drive, in fact. So we almost walked right by, the, um, right by where, they, where they lived, which would have been a little bit further down 83rd Street. So pretty neat. Pretty cool. Yeah, so my, my granddad uh, was recruited right after school and, and ended up going uh, in 1945 uh, for, the, for the end of World War II to be a dental surgeon in, uh, in the Philippines and, um, you know, help people out. So, all right, how about that? See, stopped raining, and then I was able to touch this, the screen and touch pictures. So, um, so what we're looking at here is the the low memorial library and as we've already learned this is not where the two million tombs or uh, books are, are located those books are, are back there at the butler library but the low memorial library is where the library it used to be today it is where the president of columbia university sits uh, it's also where uh, the visitor center for columbia is and finally, it's also where you can see some pretty cool inscriptions up there showing you, what does it say, guys? Can you read that? King's College, founded in the province of New York by royal charter in the reign of George II. Perpetuated, 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 God, Chris. Oh, I wish I'd gone to a good school. I could learn to read good. <laughs> perpetuated as Columbia College by the people of the state of New York. 
uh, when they became free and independent, maintained and cherished from generation to generation for the advancement of the public good and the glory of Almighty God. And this is one of the cool things about Columbia University was that it was also um, when they were trying to figure out what it was going to be as far as like what religious denomination the Columbia University was going to have. They said this should just be like an Elysium to education up in the, you know, up in the north of, of Manhattan. And therefore it shouldn't specifically have a religious a religious denomination connection should allow for people from all Christian <laughs> religions, not just Protestants or Catholics, but both, all the religions. <laughs> anyway, uh, the other thing worth looking at really quick here is, whoops. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing worth looking at here is Alma Mata, uh, you know, our, our giving mother. Uh, and she is this statue, this bronze statue here, very, very famous part of, um, <laughs> of, of Columbia University. And it's on these steps here, the low, uh, the low Memorial Library steps, which is also really important because this is where, you know, the, the kids come and hang out. And it's along these steps that, you know, a lot of the, the social life of Columbia University takes place. So if it wasn't raining and if it wasn't like a shitty day, you would you would have you'd have them like those guys are up there hanging out right now. If you can see them, you'd have those folks all over all over this place. So um, Kristen's asking for us to find the owl and what she's talking about specifically is that somewhere in alma mater's robes, there is an owl. Um, and if you can find the owl, then apparently as a freshman, somewhere in her robes, if you can, fi if you can find the owl hidden in her robes, then you are going to become none other than the class valedictorian. Because, you know, you found the owl first. Where could this bloody owl be? Wait, you saw the owl? What? What? <gasps> I think that's it. I think we see the owl. Good eyes, guys. Good eyes. Diana, Kristen, Shannon. Job well done, guys. Thanks for pulling me back there. I didn't notice it, but now everyone gets to see the owl. So go on. You're all valedictorians for the day from Sandman University. Congratulations. How cool, huh? You know what else is cool? The architect, excuse me, the, arch, yeah, the, the sculptor of this specific uh, statue is none other than the great Daniel Chester French. Yes, Daniel Chester French. And Daniel Chester French, whoop whoop, is known for the statues that are in front of the Alexander Hamilton um, uh, uh, Customs House, which is at Bowling Green. It's where we start our free walking tours in New York. It is also where we will be starting our free walking tours in New York again in just a couple of weeks from now. Get excited. That's crazy times. We're going to be back walking around in New York doing free walking tours. It's amazing. Uh, so that's coming up soon. But he's actually probably better known um, not as the guy that's, that did the sculptures at our meeting point in New York. He's better known as being the sculptor for the Lincoln Memorial. He did Abraham Lincoln. You can kind of get a feeling for that. Right, you can see that this alma mater and the Abraham Lincoln statue have something in common, which is pretty neat. Oh, crud! Kristen says I'm going to get I'm going to get flagged by the, <laughs> the Columbia University police. I'm sure I'll probably just get uh, I'll just get in trouble with with Columbia University graduates who will who will complain about my inaccuracies and all the stuff that I left out while visiting their absolutely stunningly gorgeous campus. Ah, oh, look at this. It is raining again. How's that? Dan, is the camera okay? It looks, I, my screen looks like it's all right at the moment. Well, we're going to walk back over towards Barnard University's campus and I'm going to beeline my butt up to um, the Grant, Grant's tomb and then we're going to call it a day. I'm sorry that we've gone so long. This was not my plan. I am not trying to do marathon long tours. It's, it's actually just because I'm a little bit it's my first time doing it, so it ends up taking a lot longer. But 
just gorgeous. And you can hear a bird chirping here, and it's peaceful and quiet. And look, look at these students. They don't care that it's raining. They're just coming here. They're coming here and hanging out anyway. They're like, these are the Low Memorial Library uh, steps. This is where we hang out. So thank you, Diana. I really appreciate the support. Thank you. All right. So let us continue. Goodbye, gorgeous Columbia University, Lafayette Post. You see Lafayette's name pop up a lot because the Marquis de Lafayette was, um, you know, he was a big hero here. And of course, Alexander Hamilton and uh, the Marquis were, were buddies during the Revolutionary War. And Hamilton himself was a, uh, uh, an early graduate from Columbia University. So hence, you get, you get a lot of Hamilton around. Um, I think this is a really cool little, little hall here. Uh, what is it called? Looking at my notes, must remind myself, Earl Hall. There it is, Earl Hall. Erected for the students that religion and learning may go hand in hand and character grow with knowledge. I really like that little testament that it just said there. And it reminds me of a, uh, it reminds me of something that my, my high school would say. Um, which is that goodness without knowledge is weak and feeble, but knowledge without goodness is dangerous. So don't just teach people how to do things. You got to teach them responsibility as well. Anyone want to guess what the animal symbol of Columbia University is? Anyone know? Anyone know? Columbia University's animal symbol. Tell me in the chat. Any guesses? Oh, the owl. That would be a good guess. That would be a good guess. Although I'm pretty sure, I think it's the lions. I don't, I actually don't know. I think it's the lion. I do think it's the lion. Yep. There it is. The scholar's lion. Yes. Hey, the, the animal symbol of Columbia University is the lion, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? See, there you go. They knew. They knew. For us, it was the bulldog. For us, it was the bulldog. So we're going to cut back over towards Broadway right now. And then, like I said, we're going to beeline our way up to, to Grant's tomb. So we've got about, I'm gonna say we've got 10 minutes to go guys and then we're gonna call it a day. Uh, I probably should have put a cut point in the middle of this to be able to allow this to be two videos. People are definitely in the throes of graduation. And are there gonna be steps out here for me to escape? There are not. We're gonna go this way instead, past this beautiful little Japanese maple. Mm. Oh. oh, here we go. Mathematics. If I'd been better at that, I would not have been a tour guide. I would have taken that job in finance. But then we, we wouldn't have all met. So it all worked out the way it was supposed to be. Oh, Kristen used to study there. How about that? Beautiful. Oh, gosh, I love Japanese maples. Hi there. Mm. You just like stare at those trees all day. Right. So uh, Barnard College, which is across the street from us, as we head down past Earl Hall here. Oh, oh, no, no, Chris, you will not be getting through that gate. It's just a joke. 
how am I going to escape from this campus? <laughs> it might be that we really do not get to Ulysses S. Grant's tomb today if I can't figure out a way <laughs> out of here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, I'd love to skip Barnard Crescent, as you suggest. I just don't know. I don't know how I get out of here. Let's ask. Let's ask someone. Let's see. Uh, pardon me. Do you know if there's how, how I can get off of the quad area and back onto Broadway from here? So you're going to go down these stairs. We're going to hook her right and follow it around. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day, guys. Okay. Oh, no, no, not mine. But thank you. I appreciate that watching out for me. Well, that was very kind of them. They're very nice people. They, someone had left something there. And, uh, and there it was. Look at this guy. I'm gonna say it's my boy Pan, maybe. Hello, are you a satyr? Oh, close feet. That's my man, my man Pan. Here's the backside shot of Pan. Not what I planned to do, but that's what ended up happening. Strong back. All right, lots of art, love it. Not as much art as uh, Yale University, of course. But not everybody can be Yale, so uh, yeah. Oh, here we are. This is what happens when Chris does not walk the route right before the tour. We end up uh, getting a second view. I wanted to show you guys something else here. Have you noticed the amazing garbage cans? Look at Columbia University's amazing garbage cans. And their enormous pots. Look at those pots. Check out those buns, Shannon says. <laughs> I couldn't have left without us seeing this fountain again. Yeah, you guys are very patient. So, well, <laughs> yeah. So what else we got today? Um, who saw Bernard's tour this morning? Was anyone on that one? Uh, when we went to Singapore for a little end of Ramadan? Finally, finally we solved for the video and having good, strong video. Boxcast, man. Never use that again. No way. Uh-uh. Stream direct. It finally kind of worked. And Bernard did a, did a bang up job. He's on hiatus for a little while. Later on today, um, not so much for my European friends. Sorry guys, I know it's late, but we're gonna be heading to Nara with, Sho, uh, with Shohei and with Maggie, Toyota. And that's gonna be absolutely gorgeous. But um, it's gonna be late for the, the Europe crew um, a little bit. Yep, looks like same way in, same way out. You know, I bet it's because it's the weekend and during the week, we could get out that other gate over by Earl Hall, not on weekends. Hence, that's why we're here. Okay. Oh, Diana, yeah, you'll enjoy that. I think it was a good one. Yeah, the lessons from this tour and all is stream direct, direct stream. For sure. And uh, time your tours so it's not raining. Lorraine, what did you think about Bernard's tour? I Look, the fact of the matter is, is that there are Singaporeans who speak English like, Hello, my name is Bernard Coe. I am from Singapore. You might not know from my accident, accent because I was educated brilliantly. And, and Bernard has a, you know, he's an accent. Um, he didn't grow up fancy-pantsy. 
Yeah. See, this is the direction I would have come out. I have, I, Kristen, I walked through this gate the other day. I promise you. Ah, boom. How about that? Posted. Very, very clear. Open weekday, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Well, serves me right. Should read signs. Be less of a dude. So Bernard, uh, Barnard College is one of the buildings right over there. We're going to see a couple more as we walk down the street. Uh, they have a lot of property up here as well. And Barnard, um, I know, I knew a, a woman from Barnard who, who'd studied at Barnard at one point. And uh, it was, uh, it's like the sister school for Columbia that until Columbia started to admit women into the, into the school, which I believe they didn't even do until 1983, some ridiculously late period of time, um, you, you could go to Barnard, which is an all women's college, and then take classes at Columbia. And then finally your degree uh, would be like co-signed by Columbia and Barnard. Um, and uh, what Barnard's especially famous for is, the, uh, is their teaching college. Um, so the teaching college, well, you know, for a lot of women, that was a job historically that you, you could get um, was to teach. And what I've, what I've read is that it's also one of the reasons why, why teachers tend to still be so poorly um, compensated, at least in the United States, is because it's still like, there's just this tradition of underpaying women and, and not paying women equally. And you know who would have had a problem with that? I'll tell you, Joan of Arc, right? Another reason why we started over at Jones Square, because like guys, we just gotta like move off of this BS about, about not, having, not having gender equality. It's just a, it's a really dangerous, really dangerous perspective for us to allow to continue to have. So that street sounds loud to me. I can, whoop, sorry puppy dog, I see some construction. Oh, here's a beautiful building. We were just talking about the uh, Barnard uh, Teachers College, and this is it, right here. Gorgeous old brick building with this beautiful brownstone down at the base. And we're gonna walk one more block down the street here. We'll turn in, we'll take a quick look at Grant's tomb. We're gonna walk by uh, Riverside Church, which you can already see a little bit of over here on the other side of this building. And, uh, and we're gonna call this a wrap at a mighty long two hours of time. So you guys are amazing, you folks who are still here. I completely appreciate it if you're, you've gone to the bathroom a couple of times, if you've cooked dinner, if you're actually driving somewhere right now, uh, and you're, you're focusing on something else, I gotta cross here. Um, all, of it's, all of it's completely understandable, uh, and, uh, and I would understand. Nancy Dulro, 84, says, hey, on Twitch. It's my first comment on Twitch, which is uh, something that gets me in a stitch because uh, life can be challenging at times. Uh, Nancy, I'm really good. Um, if you want to check out the tour where everyone else is, you can come over and join us on Facebook or even better, YouTube. Because YouTube is where we love you to watch. Because when you watch on YouTube, we get them hours and hours on YouTube allow us to reach more people. So, um, you know, we do these, these tours that we do, not me, but you know, when we do them, the live streams, we do them on a, a gratuity donation basis. And I've seen tours that are selling for like $15 doing the exact same tour that we do. And they'll have hundreds of people signed up to pay 15 bucks a pop. And I haven't figured it out. I haven't figured out how that is that like they charge a bunch 
for a tour, which I honestly don't believe is, I think it's worse than the tours that we do. And yet, maybe it's they're using that money for advertising. I'm not sure. Um, Nancy, the, the tour on YouTube, you just go to uh, YouTube and you can search Sandman's Live, S-A-N-D-E-M-A-N-S, uh, Live, L-I-V-E. Looks like someone just posted it, potentially, for this video specifically. The channel is Sandman's Live. And uh, we do live streaming free tours. You can donate to some of them, not this one. Um, but you can donate to many of them. And uh, we've got another one later on today from Nara, Japan, which is close to Kyoto. And then we've got two more tomorrow. One from uh, uh, Barcelona and one from Berlin. And the one from Barcelona that we're doing tomorrow is of the Sagrada Familia with Patrick Reyes. And the one from, uh, from Berlin is gonna be of the Jewish district of Berlin. Uh, which way am I going here? I'm gonna go this way. It's the Jewish district of Berlin and it's gonna be really good with Nick Jackson, who's, uh, who's really great. And Sybil, thank you. You're very sweet uh, to, to say that. Uh, bless your heart too. Thanks for watching. It can't work without all of us. We all need to do it together. Thank you for subscribing, Nancy. I really appreciate that. Woo. Talking and walking. Really cool little statue here of uh, uh, Butterfield. General Butterfield. He was, um, well, was he an admiral, Butterfield? But he was an integral part for, uh, for New York's uh, militia regiments. And thank you, Nikki, for shouting out our buddy, Nick Jackson. Here we've got Riverside Church. Uh, also gorgeous building. Hey, Manuela. Ciao, Manuela. Um, Riverside Church, famous for, I'm walking through Socorro Park right now, really quick. Bye, Palmetta. We're coming to the last four minutes of the tour right now. So if you guys gotta go, now's a good time to do it. So we're walking through Socorro Park. If we'd been here for the cherry blossoms, it'd be all lit up. Um, this church here, Riverside Church, is where Martin Luther King um, gave a speech about one year before his assassination, condemning and criticizing uh, the Vietnam War. Something that he, he hadn't done, even though he was never a war supporter because, of course, African-Americans are regularly screwed over in the U.S., maybe everywhere, but certainly in the U.S. Um, and, uh, uh, and in war, they tend to like, be treated like cannon fodder often, so also not great for them. Um, and uh, he gave a speech here condemning the war, something that he hadn't done previously, um, simply because he, he was partnered with LBJ, um, you know, Lyndon Johnson, on, on a lot of efforts for the civil rights movement, which LBJ was a, was a big supporter of. But um, in the end, like there was just like with Muhammad Ali and so many other celebrities really taking a stand against the Vietnam War, he couldn't, he couldn't help but kind of come out against it. And his main, main part from that speech was, a true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. Um, it's often thought that within a year, right, part of the reason why MLK is assassinated is because he took that stand against the Vietnam War. So um, many people link those things and say he lost his life because of it. Well, here we are guys, at the very end of our tour, uh, and we get a look at Grant's tomb. It's closed off right now because of COVID stuff, but guess what? It's all gonna go away pretty soon. Uh, July 1st, officially New York City is fully back and open, and already by May 17th, we can have groups on the street. We're, not, we're waiting till the following weekend for our tour, but it's the old joke here of who is buried in Grant's tomb. Can anyone tell me? Who is buried in Grant's tomb? Anyone know the joke? Anyone know the answer? The 
Anybody know? Anybody know why we have this gorgeous Beaux Art building here? This uh, massive edifice to uh, America's, well, credited with really saving the Union. Um, it's not Grant, Kristen. Kristen writes, it's not Grant, I'm guessing, because of course it sounds like a, tri a trick question. And that's the thing is that neither Grant nor his wife, Julia, are buried in this tomb. They are entombed in the tomb. There is a sarcophagus inside, um, which is the, in the central diocese of the building. And um, he's in there, as is, uh, as is Julia, his wife. Now, you'd think to yourself, wait a second, this guy was a president. This guy saved the United States, right? He held together the Union, right? As Humphrey Bogart was smoking cigars, Grant was out there fighting fights. And yet, why is he not at Arlington Cemetery? Why is he not in Washington, D.C.? Why is this tomb not there instead? And the reason of it is simply this. Grant, general of the, of the Union forces, and then later on president, said that he would only be buried or he'd only be located with his wife and his wife Julia could not be buried next to him at Arlington Cemetery or at, a, at you know a, a, a big cemetery a, a big one of the big national military cemeteries they would have had to have been buried separately and he said no I won't do it now Grant's not usually considered a, a New York luminary because he, he wasn't he wasn't from here uh, he was out from out the out Midwest, and that's where he kind of gets his career, you know, in the military started. Uh, and then, you know, he's in D.C. most of his life. But after he was done with the war, after he was done with presidential service, after all of that's finished, he ends up moving to New York. And he spends the last decades of his life here in New York City. Um, and hence, boom, this is where they end up deciding to have him, uh, him, him entombed, so to say. So. Uh, along with Julia because they couldn't have been together someplace else so they're in there together which I think is really really neat and it's like a theme that I felt from um, with the Strausses and Ida Strauss saying no I'm gonna I'm gonna go down with the ship with Isidore and uh, Grant saying no I mean I want my wife to be buried next to me so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna forego the great honors of Arlington Cemetery and be here instead um, and where are we? We're up here now at the very top of, of, uh, of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. And this is the whole idea that, you'd, you know, this was, this was a fancy schmancy, beautiful neighborhood and area. And this would be the kind of the, the final section of, uh, of, your, of your trip up here before you start to um, much further than this. And you've, you've, left, um, you've left Riverside Park and you're getting into like like Washington, you know, Washington Heights Park and, uh, and, and that kind of area. So we just cross over here and, uh, and wrap it up um, in, a, in a sec. Now, if you guys saw my, my video of uh, the Amy Old Child, then you've already been over here in this area. Um, this lot of land right over here is where the Battle of Harlem takes place as Washington's troops escape from New York in 1776 after the, the Battle of Brooklyn has been lost for the American revolutionaries. We can see that we're very close to the Hudson River, get a feeling of what this area would have looked like again back in the day for there were lots of people around the area. And um, I'm going to walk over to the amiable child and just finish right there. But let you guys all know, thank you. You stuck with me for two hours on this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon. Your thumbs ups mean a great deal. If you want to help me out, really, if you want to help me out, you're not going to donate on this tour. But you could go back and take a look at some of the past videos that we've shot on our YouTube channel and just give some thumbs ups to those videos. If you saw those videos yourself and you left a comment on Facebook or something, or you chatted on the YouTube video, go ahead and leave a comment uh, for that video itself. I'll write back to you. Thank you for that as well. It means a big deal for me uh, to, to have that because your comments and your engagement on, uh, on videos lets the algorithms know that 
it's worth showing more people to. So um, that's a way that you can, you can help right now. Nikki, I really appreciate you being here. You and Ross are great. You're incredible supporters uh, and friends. I consider you guys friends. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Edinburgh going for pints at Cloisters or Bow Bar or, you know, maybe uh, hitting, some, hitting some golf balls around or something like that. Diana, thank you. You're, you're incredibly supportive. Lorraine, Daniel, and Michelle, three of you, honestly, you guys make a big difference for us. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, Michaela, moi, vielen Dank. Um, wir sehen uns bald, bestimmt. Irgendwo, irgendwann, es kommt wieder. Uh, and uh, God, I don't want to not say goodbye to anyone. Uh, Klaus, thank you. Bar, Literat, Lalatav. Until next time. Uh, Palmyra, thank you. It means a lot. God, I, I, can't, I can't wait to, I gotta do a tour in Mexico. I really want to be there uh, as well. Teague, Shannon, Canada. You guys are, you guys are amazing. And now we've just walked over as you, oh, Kristen, sorry. Mwah. Thank you. I appreciate everything you do uh, to help support us. It means, it means the world. Um, so behind me, if we remember, we were just over at Grant's tomb. And then just to call it a wrap up, this is that, to show you how close it is, down in this little space here, we've just seen the, the last resting place of a US president, military leader, the general that hold the, held the union together. And this is the final resting place of St. Clair Pollock. Uh, St. Clair, the age of five years old, died here in 1797. Rolled off this, or kind of fell off this cliff uh, as, a young, as a young child. And his father or uncle created this private burial spot. There's very, very few people who are, who are private citizens that were buried uh, on public lands, and, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, erected to the memory of an amiable child, St. Clair Pollock. So it's an interesting juxtaposition. This tiny monument to this five-year-old child and that massive monument over there to the president, um, both of them up here at the top of Riverside, of Riverside Park, um, up here in now what is officially Morningside Heights. We've crossed over. <sighs> Done. Two hours, eight minutes in. Guys, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you again. I can hear your applause. I feel it. I feel it coming through. Thank you so much. You guys are the best. And uh, maybe see some of you for Shohei later on, and certainly for Sagrada Familia with uh, Patrick and Berlin's Jewish area with uh, Nick Jackson for tomorrow. That's Chris Sandeman right here, signing off from the Upper West Side of New York City, the Big Apple the city that never sleeps, the International Space Station, which belongs to no one country. Thanks for meeting me here today. I'll see you guys soon.